morning everyone, my name is Francesca, I have the pleasure to work with uh, Dr. Zorbo in his uh, uh, office and uh, as some of you probably know in 2016 uh, Dr. Zorbo decided to establish the CTBTO Youth Group which is now the largest youth-led initiative in the realm of nuclear disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation. We count 900 members from 101 countries and we are growing steadily every month through simply you know friendship and peer-to-peer -peer contacts these young people recruit uh, young professionals like themselves who then promote the CTBT, promote nuclear disarmament, nuclear non-proliferation around the world. We have done many initiatives all over the world in Asia, in South America, in North America, in Europe in the Middle East and also of course in Africa where we hope actually to do more uh, in the next uh, uh, few months and few years. So for us intergenerational dialogue is, is indispensable. This treaty as uh, Dr. Zobo said of course is not yet into force and we believe that it is only through the involvement of the new generation of young professionals that we will really be able to push forward and get the treaty in force. So we rely a lot on their talent and their creativity to find ways to uh, promote the treaty and promote the cause we are all working on. And so today I'm absolutely delighted to have four of my young professionals with me. There are many in the room, there are nine. Uh, no particular reason why we selected these four. They, they volunteer, they are great speakers, and so we've selected them, but I can guarantee you that all around the room there are fantastic talent, and I hope you will, you will engage with them. And we want to have a conversation also with someone who certainly doesn't need any introduction, Ambassador Helen, who has been, now I discover, the first female diplomat in uh, multil multilateralism representing Egypt, is a very established diplomat. And for us, intergenerational dialogue is a dialogue among generations, but also among professionals. Professionals like Ambassador Allen and these four uh, young um, students and professionals here uh, from African countries. So I'm going to moderate the dialogue, but I hope that if you have any question or any comment, please you know, feel free to, to raise your hand. So I want to start, of course, with uh, Ambassador Allen, just because of your history and your accomplishments, and you represent such an important country, I have to say. So Ambassador Allen, could you tell us how did you get to this stage? How did you get to this incredible career and these accomplishments? Good morning, everyone, and um, this is a surprise uh, to me. <laughs> I, uh, I think I, uh, I've never intended to uh, kind of speak about myself per se. I mean, it's um, I'm not in the habit of really uh, doing that, but um, anyway, um, let me tell you this. I mean, um, Women in Egypt started, or young ladies in Egypt, started joining the foreign service in, uh, the first one was in 1961. And uh, uh, um, by 1970, there were always uh, only around uh, 10 Egyptian uh, young ladies uh, joining the foreign service uh, over the span of 61 till 70. Um, as of the 70s, it started a little bit, uh, a little bit booming and, and moving uh, ahead. And uh, actually, I was not meant to become a diplomat. I, uh, I was third of my class. Uh, I graduated from the School of Economics and Political Science in Cairo University, and uh, I was um, third of my class. So I was supposed to be uh, a lecturer at the university. University. But um, it took, they told me, we need six months to get you the, the paperwork done. And uh, I said, okay, so what do I do? I, uh, I stay six months doing nothing, so there is an ad in the papers, we need diplomats. Uh, okay, so let's do it. I mean, use the time to do it. So I uh, applied for a diplomatic corps and uh, we were around um, 1,000 candidates who presented their papers because to become a diplomat in the Egyptian Foreign Service, you have to pass like three days of exams, written exams about international law, political geography, uh, uh, international relations, political crisis, lots of stuff. Inter so, so we had to do that. And uh, then you have the um, uh, 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 personal uh, uh, interview and uh, 
all of a sudden the, uh, the, 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 the um, it came out and uh, I was first of the class over the 1000 so uh, our foreign minister of the day I'm sorry to, to, to ha I'm, I'm just trying to, to make life a little bit uh, less complicated <laughs> so uh, the foreign minister of the day was a um, a member of the uh, 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 revolution 1952 revolution people and uh, he was the minister of foreign affairs and for uh, people from the uh, military and I think we have a few of them around here I mean the, the first class the class is always named after the first of the class so for him this is the first time uh, a, a girl is, uh, is is the first of the class is he going to name the class after the first of the class no way so he said no 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 I mean uh, um, let's wait a little bit maybe she gets fed up and uh, she just quits so um, the, the, his chief of cabinet uh, just called me and said um, do you really want I, I, I hear you have another opportunity you, 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 you really want this job do you know what it entails I said I don't know I just presented credentials and this is what happened and uh, I said okay I said okay so you insist yes uh, so can you come and meet the minister you know, I mean, it was difficult for me, you know, a girl. Uh, and at the time, by, mind you, we used to wear very short uh, skirts and uh, no sleeves and all this kind of looks, you know, of the 1970s. And it was funny, you know, you have to go to meet the minister like this. And so I went. So he'd asked me, why do you, why do, you do that? And all kinds of questions that would lead you at the end to take a decision, no, I'm not going to, to, to join. But uh, so I told him something very funny. I told him, listen, uh, in 1919 in Egypt, women went out of their veil and, and they went down the streets in, in, in Egypt telling, we have the right to vote, we have the right to education, to have the right to that. So how come in the 1970s, you come and tell me the first class, the first of the class is a girl, you, 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 you have a problem with that. And so um, the guy just said, "Okay, let me let me see." And uh, he 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 signed the decree because we get appointed by a presidential decree based on the opinion of the foreign minister. So he signed the decree, and I became that girl who, who, who kind of um, broke the taboo uh, of the. Uh, uh, but the point, my point is that. Um, Thinking about it later, I mean, being the Minister of Foreign Affairs and, uh, you know, I mean, it could have happened that he could just put me on the 10th uh, level or at the end of the class and finish. I mean, nobody would have asked him, why did you do that? But uh, he didn't. And I think I took a lesson from that, that you have a point to prove and you think you can do it. Just hold on to your... Um, stand and, and just go ahead and do it. And uh, you mentioned being the first uh, Egyptian diplomat. Uh, actually, it was not the practice in our foreign service ever to send uh, ladies diplomat to multilateral organizations like New York, Geneva, Vienna. It was considered really a, uh, a men's uh, home. So no girls should go there. And at the time, I was married. I was a mother. and. Um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the day just called me again. I mean, I, I have a lot of uh, stories with our Ministers of Foreign Affairs. And um, I can tell you I, during lunch, but not now. But this one I will tell you. So he said, okay, you're the first of your class. We, this is, uh, we, we would like to send a lady diplomat to New York. Uh, and uh, uh, we think that uh, we will use you as a guinea pig. This is what he exactly he used. You'll be our guinea pig. If you manage, then you have opened the door. If you can't manage, then that's it. And to me, of course, going to New York was not even in the realm of my dreams. I mean, it was not that. So uh, I go home. What will I tell my husband, my mother? <laughs> How will I organize my life? I mean, what's going to happen to me? And um, so anyway. Getting out of the minister's office, uh, one of the young diplomats of the day, who later became a foreign minister, told me, oh, you shouldn't be going. You are going to get hell out of everything. You will not be able to do the job. It's hectic. It's a killing job. You will have to, to, to work like 15 hours a day. And 
with your husband and your family and your children. I suggest you put in a formal apology and don't go. This gentleman became a foreign minister later on, and I worked with him, and um, he apologized for having said that to me. But uh, again, this is another lesson in, in, in life, you know, um, that you will always find people who will kind of um, try to break down your will or put you on another track, so uh, you just lose your way. But again, hold on to what you have so that you can always go ahead and prove that eventually these people are wrong. I will not tell you any more stories. I think it's enough for today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I turn to the young people, I would like um, to ask a follow-up question, Ambassador, so then you can help us think through how we can do better our job. You look at the region right now, uh, you look at Egypt, but you also look at the global debate around nuclear disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation. What do you think should be done to create a real new global generation of nuclear experts that know the history, but also they have a, a vision about the future? What would be, in your view, some of the things that we should be doing and should invest right now? Okay, um, I'm not about to, to, to do the role of the wise woman or the wise guy. I mean, it's, it's not my intention at all. But since you put the question, let me tell you that um, I think uh, CTBTO started. I mean, this is what you've been done, being speaking about, you know, the interns of CTBTO. So this is one a very pragmatic and effective way of approaching uh, the matter, education, and the promotion of those who are interested in that. So I think this is one way. There are a lot of ways, and uh, I think a lot of uh, my colleagues... I think that a lot of my colleagues here have expressed that, that, that how to do about it, what to, to go about it, what do they expect from new generation, what are the hiccups of uh, that approach. How? And I think one of our colleagues yesterday, I think it was you, who spoke about why the hell do we have to you know, go through such a hard time trying and then we don't find a job or we will not do that. So these are all concerns that we have to take into uh, account. But we have also to look at the history of the continent. We have to look at the history of our countries. And uh, uh, oh. and take it seriously and um, try to make the best out of what uh, we have. But uh, let, let me turn it around. Let me turn it around. I mean, uh, you, you said that quite, quite here I have them, uh, uh, four bright uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let, let us try to overlap it and um, ask them. They have been hearing a lot of experts. I mean, they have been hearing diplomats, they have been university professors, uh, military, police, uh, 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 people working in, in the field from uh, 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 organizations and institutions and, uh, in different African countries. Would you allow me to just turn it over to them and let them share with, with, their, with the, 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 the colleagues here uh, eventually what are the takeaways, the main takeaways that each and every one uh, took uh, out of this uh, very, very fierce, I mean yesterday was a fierce day, I mean it, we really had very fierce conversations, but it was vibrant exciting and uh, I, I think we achieved a lot yesterday and we actually opened a lot of doors that were not on the table when we decided to, to join here. So uh, let me start by ladies first. I'll take uh, Magdalene. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Where do you come from? What do you do and why? Okay. Here you go. So good morning, I'm Magdalene Wanyaga from Kenya. I uh, joined the youth group back in 2016. We were part of almost the founding members. I was also the African coordinator for the African youth for the CTBTO in 2018. Um, the takeaway, the main takeaway that I had from this 
forum yesterday mainly was how we looked at things realistically because we are used to going to forums and having um, taking things from the policy perspective, just whatever is on paper and not whatever can what can we apply in our continent and for our continent. So that was a very main takeaway for me. Yeah, I'll give the others the opportunity and then we'll go on. I'm Regina Osei-Bonsu, also a member of the CTBCO Youth Group. I joined in 2017. I'm from Ghana, okay. and I'm reading an MPhil in Nuclear and Environmental Protection. Yesterday, I, I took a number of cues to this meeting, and the very important question that came up was, as a continent, do we need nuclear energy? Ready, ready, and if we are ready, what are the steps we need? The more that I got was that we have to be disciplined as a people, as people of we need thing. And once we have the discipline, we'll be able to give more. Again, we need to be united as a people. We need to we need to have cooperation between countries where we can train. For example, there was an instance um, we were told of other countries coming into Ghana, people from other countries coming into Ghana, especially the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, to be trained. And I think that's a good thing for us as a continent. So my, that's, that's what I got from it. And I also believe that our attitude towards work as a people, it's going to go a long way to help us. So that's what I got from. All right. Thank you very much. I am Ahmed Amponsan Fajor from Ghana, and I, I joined the CTBTO Youth Group in 2017, also one of the pioneer members as well. And I think yesterday, joining uh, this workshop, we really learned a lot for myself, you know. And then I realized from the experts and diplomats around here that as Africans, we need to pay much attention to the Palim Palindeba Treaty. As Africans as we are, we need to pay much attention to it because when you look at the NPT, it's been reviewed every five years. But uh, the Palindeba Treaty has, uh, was formed, I think, next year will be 25 years. And then uh, next year will be 20, uh, 25 years since its formation. And next year will be 20, 10 years since um, it, it became uh, into force uh, for its application. And I feel most systems have changed, so it calls that Africans need to rev uh, review the Palindeba Treaty. And I think the viability, the viability of the Palindeba Treaty also would help in NPT and, and also the CTBTO. So I think it, it, it's a very good call for Africans to uh, do justice to the Palindeba Treaty. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Farai Sean Matiashe, and uh, I'm a journalist based in Mutare, Zimbabwe. Uh, my articles are, are published on, on Al Jazeera. Uh, I also write for United States based uh, Quartz Africa and uh, the world. I also do articles for United Kingdom based uh, uh, Thompson Readers Foundation. Uh, I, I focus much on, uh, on, on science journalism. Uh, previously, like when I started uh, my career as, as a journalist, I, I used to, to, to write on, on almost everything from uh, politics, uh, business, uh, social issues uh, to, to entertainment. But uh, I, I, I just thought to myself, like, I, I need to, I need to, to, to focus on, 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 on certain bits in journalism and, and not everything. Then I, I, I developed a passion for, 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 for science journalism. So I, 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 there's, there's this uh, conference that I attended in the United Kingdom in, in, in 2018 for, for, for young journalists. So through my interaction with, uh, with uh, other young journalists, uh, that that conference uh, brings together about 100 young journalists from from all over the world. Uh, that's when I met uh, some 
some young journalists who were part of the, the CTPTO uh, CYG. Then uh, they gave me some links and I, I, I joined the group in, in 2018. Then I was like, uh, where I have, I have uh, joined uh, this group, so what can I do? And I was like, as a journalist, I have to, to, to bridge the gap between uh, scientists and, um, and, and the mass. Because as someone who had studied uh, mass communication, some someone who is who has got the skills and uh, who has got the skills and the and the knowledge to to communicate uh, to, to the mass. So I'm now more into 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 science journalism, you know, educating and and informing the mass. Okay. Um, uh, the takeaway from 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 this workshop is is that. Um, uh, we need uh, we need we need capacity building. Uh, there is need to 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 have uh, more investment in uh, in in, uh, in education. Uh, there is need to ensure that uh, there is uh, they, they are more young young professionals who are who are into 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 the science uh, science field. Uh, there is there is also there is also need. To, to ask ourselves, like, uh, if you were to, to venture into into nuclear energy, for instance, do we have the the the, the human resources that that is needed when undertaking such initiatives? Thank you. We have uh, one more question, and perhaps I would invite some of you maybe to ask or to comment or share your views on on this. How can do how can we do intergenerational dialogue better? So there is a lot of emphasis right now on having youth at the table. The UN Secretary General just launched uh, this initiative of Youth for Disarmament in 2019 for the first time in the history of the first committee of the UN General Assembly. Uh, the General Assembly uh, approved a UN resolution on youth for nuclear disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation. So this is your time, guys. And uh, I also want to disclose that many of our donors, including big donors like the European Union, are really very uh, you know, determined to have young people at the table in key international conferences. So the donor community is also coming through really to have young professionals uh, to be involved. But I would like to ask you, you know, when you think about youth inclusiveness or you know, strengthening the youth voice, what would you like to see from your perspective uh, what does it mean to you to be part of these conferences and how can we do better so that you, your voice can actually be heard better? Yes. That's an interesting question. There are various ways like we could borrow from what the Western world has done. Um, but the main thing is that we don't just come to such forums for participation only, we have to actively get engaged, not just out of our proactiveness, but also like what has been done here where the facilitators made sure that we are actively participating. That is one part that I would say we are kind of lacking in Africa. Um, we have the African Union that, and, and getting a, a, an institution like, you know, the CTBTO Youth Group to participate actively in the African Union has been such a huge uphill task for us, getting to get leaders to listen to our voice, because it's always, um, yeah, we, we, we appreciate the youth, but we don't actually need you at the round table discussions. We, we appreciate you there, you know, that kind of perspective. Um, I think there's also, um, we as the youth, youth should also be very, very proactive and coming up with, um, you know, changing the narrative, because if we don't change it and expect the older generation to do it for us, they're never going to do it for us. So we have to be proactive. Um, I think using the AFCON, uh, being that it's, a, it's, it's an organization on nuclear, it should actually get the youth um, involved in such a huge capacity. The Af we have such a huge pool of African youth group members that are ready to work and, you know, we, we, we go that extra mile. Um, I think we can also borrow, like, from the Ban Ki-moon Center for, for Young People. 
if we can come up with, you know, we get tailor-made solutions for Africans. Not, we borrow, yes, and tailor make it for our perspective, considering uh, uh, the kind of geopolitical situations that we are in, yeah. Okay. For me, it means a lot to be here at this conference. I, I'd say this uh, the first conference of this kind I've been to, and I've learned a lot. So I want to base all I talk about on knowledge transitioning. Now, I believe that you allowed us to be here to learn a lot from the aspects. But I also believe it shouldn't end here. We shouldn't only come and hear what you've done and are telling us and your experiences, we should also be given the opportunity to work hand in hand with you so we understudy. This morning in our earlier discussion, I mentioned that looking at the trend, I think Africa, we are losing a lot of knowledge because we wait for all the professors, all the doctors to reach retirement, then they go out of the system. And that's when the youth are brought into the system. Now, when we come into the system, what do we know? We just know what we learned from school. But I believe that as the professors are around, as the doctors are around, we are brought into the system. We understudy them. We know how they started, how they went about it, how they solved problems. We learn what they have done over the years. When they are leaving the system, they have transferred their knowledge to us. So we can take it from there, and I believe we can achieve more. But when we have to come into a system where they've all left and they've taken their knowledge home, how then do we build a better place? So back to what I was saying, I, I just believe that the knowledge transition should continue. It shouldn't just be here, where we only come in here. But we should also be given the opportunity to have the hands-on experience, to have the, the, the practicality of what we learn in school, so we can be better people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for me, I think I would also call on Mr. Colin from Afconi once again. I'm quite sorry, because since yesterday, we've been putting a lot of um, suggestions and recommendations to you. And I need to also confront you as well, so I have to. And one, uh, through one of uh, Mr. Collins' speech yesterday, he mentioned that uh, one thing to do to bring the youth on board is uh, they would need to, you know, bring the youth on on, on some of their workshops uh, in the Afghan programs. But certainly, that that was a good point. Normally, you go to some workshops and then you hear these things but you know after the workshop the, the implementation phase you know fades out so i think for now afkone should 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 do 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 a lot of work by bringing the youth on board because uh yesterday dr zebo already called on afkone and then today all the youth collectively we are call, calling on afkone because we are africans and then we have to call on Afkoni, and we are doing so. So please hear our voice and give us a seat on the table. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, I think I think I don't have to to to, to uh, continue patracing what has been said <laughs> by uh, my my other colleagues. But um, I feel um, there is there is need to to have uh, more opportunities for 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 Africans, uh, African youth, because uh, we are the future. Then uh, I I believe it uh, must not end here uh, at, at workshops because we don't want a situation where we we keep on talking and talking and talking. We need uh, uh, to have something uh, practical. Uh, some of these young prof professionals have uh, their proposals, have their proje projects. So I, I believe um, uh, uh, these uh, other organizations uh, should be supporting them, uh, be it uh, resources, be it uh, funding, because we are the future. Uh, that's the way to go.
also in the same uh, kind of thinking, we can, you know, yesterday Dr. Zabo said of how we could introduce some of these things in the curriculum in school. Not only at the primary high school, we should introduce it at the higher institutions. Because coming to think of it, um, I'm from a science uh, background, I'm a geologist, but it gets so hard to communicate my science when it comes to policy makers, because there's this whole jargon that we're gonna use, and, and you know, we are boring to some extent. But if we can have like the higher institutions of higher learning um, introducing, you know, coupling science communication into the, you know, giving us, not just as a, yeah, not just as a unit, but we have to practice it, because there's also on the, it's, it promotes like the, the knowledge gap, because yes, we have this information, we know we can change certain perspectives, but we don't know how to effectively communicate our science to policy makers and get policies that are informed. Um, on the same thing, I, I think we should, being that we are we, we're in this age of innovation, we should look for alternative like methods of getting the nuclear, you know, the nuclear perspective out there, not just whatever has always been done. Because when it comes to such conversations, it's about the treaties that were done. Yeah, back then in the day, but what new ways can we use to come up and, and tackle some of these uh, problems? Um, also, I, I want to say like there's this thing that Dr. Zabo usually says, and we can adopt it in Africa. We believe, most people believe that we are the leaders of tomorrow, but basically we are the leaders of today. So if you don't include us in the conversations, then our future, the future of everyone is at a very high risk. Yeah, thank you. One thing that I have to say is that Afcona has really become this big symbol of people really interested in nuclear to lead the way. And so this is great merit to you and, and the leadership of Afcona for this. Uh, the visibility is extraordinary everywhere. But I'm wondering whether you can, you can tell us a little bit more uh, to address uh, the, 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 the young, young, young people on, uh, on what they've suggested. Thank you. Let me applaud the CTBT and uh, Dr. Zebo for really coming up with this very important uh, and, uh, initiative. I think uh, it, it, it's, a, it's something that we can all see how we could complement uh, moving forward. Of course, I generally believe that uh, the youth are not the leaders of tomorrow. They are, still, they are also the leaders of today. And I, I, hence, I believe that they have a very important role to play. I think later in the program I'll be sharing some of uh, uh, AFCON's program of, for, for this year. And then we, go, we also have a strategic midterm plan for 20, 2021 to 2025. So we can see how we could uh, incorporate some of those things. Uh, I think what is really important, I think one, one way to look at it, of course, we would definitely would like to engage the youth on the continent and to see how they can be part of some of the programs that we are initiating, that we are planning, and we also want to hear their suggestions and views on, on how to make Afghani much more. So, thank you. So I think, but, but also on, uh, on uh, just from thinking ahead, of course, most of the things that we are discussing here, I will have to present that to the Bureau. And uh, obviously, and I think the recomm recommendations that are coming from here, but one of the other things we can look at, how to engage our youth, is also through internship programs in Afghan and uh, to, to, to give them the skills and the capacity and, and perhaps also to do a regional workshop for, 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 for youth science and technology on the African continent. Those are some of the things we could, we could, we could think highly of and recommend, but, but as I said, I will definitely speak later on, on the programs and then we can, we can then engage on specific ideas, how way they want to get involved in, and, or, and then we can take it from there. Thank you. Salut à tous et j'espère que vous allez très bien. Je vais m'exprimer en français pour aller plus rapidement. Euh, J'ai pu constater depuis hier que des sujets ont été abordés concernant euh, la non-prolifération des armes nucléaires et le désarmement en Afrique. Mais je me suis depuis hier penché sur une problématique qui n'a pas 
peut-être pas à mon sens été, été développé ou été touché du doigt. Je veux parler de l'implication de la je veux parler de l'implication de la conservation de la faune et de la flore et aussi de l'impact que peut avoir la non-prolifération des, des âmes nucléaires sur euh, la faune et la flore. Parce que quand on se base un peu sur l'histoire, après ce qui s'est passé euh, au Japon, on, on tiendra aussi compte du fait que après cette explosion, il y a eu une dévastation au niveau, de, au niveau des forêts et la faune et la faune, la flore a été vraiment affectée. Donc aujourd'hui, euh, en tant qu'Africains, nous sommes en train de nous tourner vers les technologies nucléaires. Et est-ce qu'il n'est pas aussi, à mon sens, important de se pencher sur euh, l'impact que peut avoir cette technologie sur la faune et de la flore C'est pour moi euh, un débat qui mérite d'être soulevé un débat qui mérite euh, euh, l'opinion de tout un chacun ici. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci à Juste un merci à tout le monde et aussi à l'ambassadeur Alam pour partager ça. C'était très inspirational. Um, je suis willing à offrir mes services. Nous avons Skype, nous avons WhatsApp, nous pouvons parler. So, whatever way um, that we can have this conversation after this meeting, let's talk, even if it's just every second week that we have a session, like a mentorship program, I'm volunteering. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, one of the things that I have been in my... Um, long career in the public service was being a director of youth and um, my own experience was that really engaging young people is one of the key factors of uh, using their expertise like uh, Regina was saying and in Botswana I think This is something that I have been motivated to take up and set up in Botswana. And I think uh, we will be um, benefiting from your support. We have a lot of young people with science uh, knowledge because we had a special program where we are taking the most, um, shall I say, the young people who have the highest achievement, and we called it High Achievers Program. And they did a lot of sciences like uh, Magdalene is saying. But when they came back, we did not use the science they have learned, either a, you know, even integrating it in the policy or improving the education curriculum so that they give us feedback about what they have learned and what can be done. And also the issue of taking information to people is also very, very fundamental. I don't uh, remember trying to make a recollection of the young journalists that I know in Botswana. And I think very few, if any, exist in science journalism. And like um, Joanne was saying, I'm offering myself also as a mentor because it's also very important to know what um, strategies you use to influence policy and get a young woman to rise in the public service until you are the head of the Ministry of Defense. It's not an easy thing where you, um, you are a decision maker among generals and you have to give them commands, general. If you, <laughs> if you know. So it's not an easy thing. We also need to integrate this science in the military curriculum because they have fantastic institutions in every military, the defense academies. But very few of them do venture into science. They are about command, uh, strategy, construction, uh, army formation, and so on. I think we need to infuse the science in the military academies 
So that is really what I wanted to 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 uh, input in this fantastic. I feel young again. <laughs> Thank you. Et merci beaucoup euh, et pour l'interpellation qui m'a été faite tout à l'heure. Effectivement, donc moi je travaille dans le cadre d'un centre qui euh, s'intéresse surtout aux questions de défense et de sécurité, mais qui euh, fondamentalement cherche à travailler pour avoir une sorte de synergie entre les forces de défense et de sécurité et les populations pour permettre aux populations elles-mêmes de participer, de contribuer à notre propre sécurité. En faisant quoi En faisant prendre en conscience de plus en plus aux membres des forces de défense, à travers les programmes de formation, qu'elles sont d'abord là pour servir la population. Et que tant que les populations qui sont censées être défendues, protégées, n'ont pas le sentiment que ces gens qui sont là, on peut leur faire confiance, ces populations n'accepteront jamais de collaborer. Donc nous travaillons dans ce sens, c'est pourquoi au niveau du centre, nous avons euh, une direction des programmes spéciaux. Et dans ces programmes, nous avons ciblé les médias, nous avons des programmes pour euh, les journalistes eux-mêmes, nous avons des programmes pour les députés, mais nous avons également des programmes pour les jeunes. Il y a une organisation euh, ouest-africaine qui s'appelle YALI, Young African Leaders International, nous travaillons ensemble à Dakar, à Abidjan et un peu partout dans la sous-région, nous avons donc des programmes annuels. Et ces jeunes regroupent des étudiants qui viennent de plusieurs pays qui se rencontrent annuellement dans une des capitales, Dakar, Abidjan ou Ouagadougou, pour discuter de leur participation dans l'effort de développement, parce qu'on ne peut pas avoir de développement sans la sécurité. Et dans cette affaire, ce qui est important, c'est montrer aux jeunes que dans tout ce que vous faites, si vous n'avez pas de discipline, vous ne risquez pas de réussir. Donc cette formation militaire, cette rigueur dans le travail, c'est ça en fait moi qui m'intéresse dans le travail et dans la collaboration que je fais avec tous les jeunes de la région ouest africaine. Merci. Et je, voulais, je vous encourage encore une fois. Pour moi, ce n'est pas, pas une question, c'est une requête. Euh, bon, c'est vrai que le nucléaire, c'est un domaine scientifique, mais je pense que pour son application responsable, il faut beaucoup intégrer euh, les sciences sociales, notamment la communication, la diplomatie, parce que derrière toute cette... Euh, cette campagne, il faut sensibiliser, il faut beaucoup sensibiliser les populations, les responsables. C'est essentiellement ça, en fait. Parce que lorsque je regarde dans la salle, je vois les participants, c'est surtout des mathématiciens, des physiciens. Voilà, il manque beaucoup euh, les communicateurs, les diplomates. Il faut vraiment ça pour son application responsable. C'est tout. All right. Please, sir. Euh, merci. En fait, euh, je voulais un peu euh, parler du, du rôle qu'il joue. Euh, bon, D'abord, je le félicite quand même euh, pour la présentation et qui montre quand même qu'il y a l'implication des jeunes euh, au niveau international et que vraiment il y a, il y a vraiment un grand engouement autour de ça parce que la question du nucléaire, il faut, il faut quand même euh, en Afrique qu'on puisse impliquer des jeunes euh, qui, à leur tour, vont impliquer leurs collègues. En fait, la question que je voulais leur poser, est-ce que eux, à leur niveau, dans leur pays respectif, qu'est-ce qu'ils font pour sensibiliser les autres jeunes qui ne sont pas membres du CTVT Parce que si on prend maintenant en Afrique, il y a beaucoup de structures de jeunes, il y a des conseils de jeunesse au niveau de chaque pays, il y a deux fois aussi certains pays qui ont le parlement de jeunes où on est en train d'apprendre euh, la diplomatie à des jeunes. Euh, mais là, eux, à leur niveau, quand ils retournent à leur pays, qu'est-ce qu'ils font 
pour impliquer leur, les autres collègues, leurs collègues jeunes ou les autres, la, la jeunesse du pays euh, pour voir euh, ce que fait, euh, euh, ce qu'ils font au niveau du, du, du groupe de CTVT. Merci. A very important question that comes uh, um, is what do you guys do concretely to sensitize and educate your peers on what CTBTO does? Because there are many infrastructures, many institutions like the Council of uh, Young uh, Youth um, Council de Jeunesse. Yes, so many other structures that exist today. And so uh, they ask you, what exactly do you do to sensitize your peers, to educate them? Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for uh, a very in interesting question. Uh, well, as a, as a, as a journalist, um i i use um my articles to 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 inform uh and educate the mass on um on the ctbto works and also uh nuclear issues uh in general uh, i get to to educate uh the mass on the on 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 the benefits of um uh having a nuclear energy for instance because um, in, in, in some countries you, you would see that if you are to talk about uh, nuclear, uh, some people have this fear, you know, the, the, the Hiroshima uh, disasters. So some people don't even want to hear about it. So we, uh, I, I try to, 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 to convince them that uh, there are other ways of uh, of benefiting from from nuclear issues uh, for instance uh, the city bto is uh, some seismic stations uh, to, to to monitor uh, any nuclear activities uh, in, in some other countries for instance in zimbabwe there is one in matopos and this station uh, is not only useful uh, to 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 monitor to is not only useful to detect uh, nuclear activities, but it can be used to monitor weather uh, in my country. So uh, we, uh, here we have been talking of uh, renewable energy. This is also another benefit that can uh, come along with uh, with these uh, nuclear issues. Uh, I also do not end at um, at at, at uh, writing articles. Uh, these days, you'd see that uh, uh, among among the youths, the culture of reading is fading away. Uh, people relate now relate more to to to, to listening uh, and and viewing uh, videos. So I I I an another 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 platform where I can get hold of youth is social media. They are almost every youth is is present on on, on social media, so I, I I ensure that I I tweet about uh, about nuclear issues. I also uh, come up with uh, very short videos, you know, those uh, two minutes uh, long videos, so that the youth can 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 view and get to appreciate. What we mean when we when you talk about uh, about uh, nuclear, then in, uh, in my country there there are various groups for 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 journalists that I'm that I'm I'm, I'm associated with. There is uh, the Journalism Students Network of Zimbabwe, an association of uh, quite a number of of, of young. Uh, of students in, in my country. There is also a Young Journalists uh, Association of Zimbabwe, Yoja, an association of, of young journalists uh, in the country. So we, we, we usually held uh, some, uh, some, some, some workshops and I will be uh, speaking at those workshops, you know, just um, just telling them what science journalism is, is, is all about. Uh, they also get to know on um, on, on on various uh, fields 
in the in, on various topics in the in the nuclear in the in the science journalism from uh, renewable energy uh, climate change and so forth um one thing th there are several aspects with uh, on the CTBTO youth group the first thing that we we are told the first thing that we know is that we do advocacy at our own personal level. So you try to advocate for the CTBT and their organization and matters nuclear energy and nuclear weapons at your own personal level, at the grassroots level. Um, that's one area that we, we are encouraged and actually are taking up on. The other part is uh, we come up with activities and initiatives that promote nuclear, we just don't re rely on the CTBTU to totally give us everything. We have to come up like with activities, maybe visit an IMS station in Kenya, we have two. So, you know, that act alone gets people to get interested. What is the CTBTU about? What is the CTBT about? What, what do you mean when you talk about nuclear weapons? Um, the other part is initiatives. Um, like currently we are taking up an initiative of um, getting a seismological center in Kenya where we want to have training and research based. It, I think I will call it a think tank. Um, with the youth in Kenya and the, East, the broader East African region, and you, this, we try to get our own funding. Like right now, we are partnering um, with the Clinton Global Initiative University. They are giving us mentorship on that. You see, we have to create ways to know how to go around it, uh, and also participation in such forums, you know, getting our voice out there. Because if we just stick to the grassroots level, then we don't get to be at the round table discussions, yeah. Okay, for me, I would also say, um, looking at how the CTB2 youth group population is growing exponentially, that tells how much work the youth uh, the pioneer members are also doing because we are really, really broadcasting it out there for other young people to, to join us. Because for me in Ghana, I would say I was the first person to be part of the youth group. And now I have a lot of other members as well from Ghana. And that's a plus for me. And then I would also say recently, I think in December last year, I had the opportunity to be in Egypt uh, for the World Youth Forum. Yeah, there were almost about 7,000 youths from all over around the world. And I, I, I was able to organize a side event basically for CTBTO to tell people, the young people, what the CTBTO is about and what the youth also do for the CTBTO. So I would say we are also doing quite a little bit of work. So thank you very much. Well, I, I just have a few comments to, uh, to share with you. Uh, uh, that how we at home um, look at things um, as far as nuclear uh, um, uh, matters are handled and um, youth matters are, uh, are looked at. Um, for me personally, the intergenerational dialogue is um, is like a tree. You know, I mean, uh, you, you put a seed, uh, you have roots, uh, you have uh, strong roots and it, the tree grows and um, you have new branches. Uh, but uh, the new branches get their feed and uh, their life from the seeds and from the seed and from the roots. So um, the intergenerational dialogue is a two-way stream. It's not only a one-way stream. Um, we have been the leaders and um, you will be the leaders. So you have to match and mix in this big tree, which is your country, your family, your uh, uh, um, village, your everything. So you have to have this two-way stream thing. The world is changing, and uh, with it, our thinking, our attitude, our posture to life also is changing. So um, I think this is how things are. And, um, I think every year we have um, youth conferences that deal with uh, Egyptian youth, then uh, uh, Arab youth and Egyptian youth, and uh, then African youth and uh, Egyptian youth, and then world youth 
uh, conferences. I think we have been through that through the last uh, three or four years. Uh, having that perspective that we have to arm youth with knowledge, with education, with a good thinking, a streamlined thinking that what really matters is your country, your well-being, your country's well-being, and also the world well-being. You should not live in a world that is becoming uh, more selfish, more self-centered, and more uh, uh, non-appreciative of the culture and civilization of uh, other people. What matters is us first and then everybody else, whatever uh, uh, comes. Uh, this is from the uh, kind of social side or the uh, ethical side to look at uh, what societies should uh, write. But uh, on the nuclear side, which is at the heart of what we're saying, actually there are two things that Africa is very special as far as this is concerned. And um, we strongly believe that um, a country in Africa that, has, that had nuclear capability, which is South Africa, and they kind of submitted at the end of the day that they are willing to totally dismantle that nuclear capacity is something playing of a role model. We don't see this coming or happening in the world of today. And I think this is a role that has to be appreciated and uh, 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 really look forward to and always mentioned that there is an African country with very special circumstances that had nuclear power but was willing to give it up for the best of the continent and the best of the world. So this is the role model and we have always to make good reference to it. The other element and the other event that not too many people know about it in Africa is that France had its first nuclear tests in the Algerian desert. And that a great many part of that Algerian desert today is radiation uh, uh, infected and uh, Algeria in so many ways has lost part of its territory because of that particular event. So I think these are two major events that have, in a way, kind of modeled our thinking about the African thinking, the African posture, attitude, the African narrative as far as uh, nuclear weapons are concerned. And it was Africa who le led the way to become a first, a first continent, a nuclear-free zone of nuclear weapons. Remember that Africa constitutes more than 25% of the world international community in terms of membership. Always remember that Africa is strong. Africa has a potential to inflict and to impact the world scenery if we get together and vote together and see what's good for us and just go together for it. So this is very important. Uh, I think that Egypt had the honor and the pleasure, actually. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's Africa in the heart. And um, we were able to manage to host the signing uh, 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 ceremony of the Pilindaba Treaty, though it was not called the, the Cairo Treaty, but it was called the Pilindaba Treaty. And I think this is the kind of reward that we have presented to South Africa for its very much of a role model that they have played. So. Uh, we were the signatory uh, uh, country, but I mean the signatory uh, uh, ceremonial uh, country, but uh, it was named the Pelindaba. So next year, 2021, is going to be the silver jubilee of the Pelindaba Treaty. And we would like very much uh, all of you who are here, uh, your peers, your colleagues, that it becomes 2021, the Pelindaba uh, uh, Silver Jubilee to be celebrated in some ways. I will be happy to, to, to share to, that you share with me what you think can be done uh, if we have an African dialogue, an African celebration, a Pelindaba Day. It was on the 11th of April 1996. Uh, a, a lot of the young contributors here and the distinguished participants in this seminar, in this workshop, spoke a lot about the need to put uh, Pelindaba Treaty up to date. I mean, if we can 
discuss and review the NPT, why not discuss and review the Perindaba Treaty and put it up to date and add up to it and put it in the proper form where we are. So these are just ideas like for put at, uh, at your convenience uh, and maybe we, we, we should have this kind of a dialogue how to, uh, how to uh, perform that uh, uh, um, later and, and see how we can celebrate that. Uh, I want to uh, refer to a couple of studies, actually, to, to tell you some of our colleagues, for example, there is a recent study by the International Committee of the Red Cross, and their takeaway was that more than half of the millennials they interviewed believe that it is very much likely that a nuclear attack will occur in the next decade, in the 2030s. Another uh, a survey conducted by the World Economic Forum. It was conducted with 1,000 leaders from government, business, and other industries. And it was their concern that in a nuclear war was a top threat for them. Uh, for us in, in Egypt or the Middle East, um, it is a, a, an imminent and a, a, a threat that poses itself because only one country in the Middle East has a, 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 a nuclear arsenal, a very substantive one, and um, it does always uh, mention that it is there for deterrence. Uh, and it is very strange that after 70 years of its establishment as a state, um, they still think that they need deterrence against their neighbors, that they can't communicate, that they can't feel safe with them, though. Nobody um, has ever contested that. And um, it does create some kind of feeling of crisis all the time that somebody could one day decide for a reason or another that, uh, well, we're going to hit you. And uh, having common borders with, uh, with Israel doesn't make Egypt at all in a very comfortable uh, situation. And now, with the growing conflicts in the Middle East, I, I think that things really does, don't look very comfortable to be polite, diplomatically polite, uh, in the area. And strange enough that what happened in the Middle East in terms of expansion of terrorism, in, in terms of expansion of extremism, has moved heavily to Africa, the unfortunate fact. So in so many ways, the Middle East and Africa are interrelated in terms of uh, geopolitical connection and in terms of political and threats, common threats between e Africa and the Middle East. And this is why we do appreciate all the time when we discuss the Middle East as a weapon-free zone of uh, uh, all weapons of mass destruction that we always have the support of the uh, African group. And I think that yesterday, that support was very much into focus and uh, uh, um, put into the right, the right uh, perspective. Uh, I will just end by, 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 by saying that uh, one of my junior colleagues, I, um, I asked him, I was discussing with him because uh, to ask him uh, this. Then he told me and he wrote to me, Ambassador, the intergenerational dialogue is not a luxury. It is a source of inspiration from your older generation creative and capable minds as how to reach a nuclear-free world, well educated about the dangers of nuclear threats. With that, I will say thank you very much. I'm very honored to, be, to have been put here. <laughs> So, uh, but I'm very happy to, to have contributed to this um, uh, workshop and this particular session. Actually, uh, most of them are like, um, well, grandchildren, but a little bit older. Uh, they're smaller, my grandchildren, but I'm very happy to have all of you and I'm very proud of you and the way you think and the way you, do, you address things. And um, I think you should go home and have something really to show off for. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you, if you allow me uh, just to say, I want to thank uh, very much 
uh, the panelist, Ambassador Allen, for for guiding us and for sharing your your uh, wisdom and your knowledge. Really, after so many years of engaging with these big, big topics, if you allow me, I also want to thank very much the media people who have allowed us to live stream uh, these panels. There are roughly 300 young people that have been following this uh, panel from all over the world. I want to thank my uh, uh, partner in crime, Marius. Who who is in Vienna setting up this live stream, tweeting like crazy, and also our African coordinator, Jaona, who is in Madagascar and who has done a fantastic job to mobilize these young people to be here. And just as a sign of uh, things really working out, we have a science and diplomacy symposium in Vienna, uh, and for the first time, since uh, the establishment of the youth group, the African delegation is going to be the largest delegation at this symposium. And most of them are young people under the age of 30. So when given the choice, these guys really take it and you have a fantastic pool of talent that you can count on. And CTBTO is going to be with you to support any activity that you want to do. Thank you again to the organizers for this opportunity, to Isabel and Hubert, and I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you.